Good afternoon, or good morning if you're on the West Coast. Um, welcome to Remaking the Economy, a policy vision from the Movement for Black Lives. I am Steve Dubb, Senior Editor of Economic Justice here at Nonprofit Quarterly, coming to you from Boston on land historically stewarded by the Massachusetts nation. For this webinar, co-sponsored by uh, M4BL, we'll hear from many of the authors who contributed to our recent article series on the vision for Black Lives, an economic policy agenda. Our, policy, our panelists are Temi F. Bennett is co-CEO of IF, a foundation of radical possibility based in Washington, DC. Amara Enya is director for policy and research at the Movement for Black Lives based in Chicago. Rosemary Ndubwisu is assistant professor of African-American studies at Georgetown University and a volunteer organizer for One DC based in Washington, DC. Rahel Teka is um, Director of Strategic Communications at the Participatory Budgeting Process Project, sorry, based in New York City. And last but not least, Richard Wallace is Founder and Executive Director of Equity and Transformation, also known as EAT, uh, EAT uh, based in Chicago. Uh, a few notes. First, uh, we're very excited to take your questions. Please enter your questions into the question box at the bottom of your screen, I'll share as many of them as I can. Of course, you're also welcome to uh, participate in the chat as many of you are doing, thanks. Uh, second, uh, we will share the slides and recording after the webinar, so please don't ask, will I get the slides and recording? You will. Um, usually they go out by Monday. Um, one last thing, the webinar is free, uh, but producing it is not. So if you like what we are doing and can afford to support MPQ's racial and economic justice work, please consider donating to MPQ today. We also encourage you to join the conversation via social media with our hashtag, hashtag rebuild the economy. Thanks for joining us and please complete the brief survey that will be at the after the webinar to inform our future work. And with that, we'll get started uh, with um, Rosemary, if you could introduce yourself and talk about how you got involved in housing justice work. Good day, everyone, or good morning, if you are on the West Coast. My apologies. I don't know my uh, messaging. So I am with an organization called Organizing Neighborhood Equity, um, 1DC. And we're based in Washington, D.C. But before I do that, I want to say thank you to the conveners, the planners, and all of you all who um, decided to join us today and participate and listen. So my story in terms of how I became a housing organizer is um, a little bit accidental. I, When I was in college, I had my vision in, or I had my realization when I was a junior in college that I wanted to be a part of the SNCC movement. I wanted to be a part of the Black Liberation Movement. And SNCC really motivated me, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a civil rights organization in the 1960s. Um, and I wanted to be a part of that after I graduated. But when I graduated from college, there wasn't a Black Liberation Movement that was active at the time. There were just nonprofits. So I decided to be part of a movement nonprofit that I thought most aligned and continued the legacy of SNCC, which was 1DC. And I started to volunteer with them. Um, and then eventually they came back and they said, hey, you want a job? And I said, of course, I want my wage work <laughs> to be in movement work. And so they told me that affordable housing um, organizer was uh, what they had. And that's when I dove in deep, uh, and that was around 2007. And since then, I've worn many hats at 1DC, um, just recently stepping down from the shared leadership team, our governance, uh, our governance body. Um, and now I just um, am a volunteer uh, movement or member organizer working with one tenant building where we're trying to support the tenants and exercising um, a unique law, uh, which is called uh, Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act which every tenant in DC, for the most part, there are, there are many exceptions, but for the most part, if you live in a multifamily rental community, if your owner decides to sell the property, the tenants have the first right um, to refuse, which means that they get the chance to potentially buy the property or assign their rights to another landlord. 
And so we're supporting the tenants now in exercising that, right? Because we want long-term permanent affordable housing in the city. And so that's my story in terms of how I got involved. And I continue to do that work in my wage job now as an assistant professor at Georgetown. Thanks so much, Rosemary. Uh, Rahel, uh, could you introduce yourself and uh, talk briefly about the participatory budgeting process? Absolutely. Um, so uh, my name is Rahel Tekka. I use she, her, they, them pronouns. I get to be the communications director at the participatory budgeting project, which means I get to tell the stories of how communities are taking control of the decisions that impact their lives. Um, participatory budgeting is a lot of syllables for what's actually a very simple idea, right? That the people who are impacted by decisions should be the people who make those decisions. So at PBP, um, we support folks in educating themselves, advocating for implementing and improving participatory budgeting, um, which is a process that has six main steps. And I'm gonna walk you through them very briefly. Um, because we could go into it for a long time. Um, but it kicks off with like starting winning PB, getting a pot of funds and like getting yourself together. And my favorite part of this whole process is, is the design phase, which is the part where you set up the kind of rules, the ways that you're going to interact with this participatory budgeting process, right? These processes can be anywhere from like $5,000 to $27 million, like we saw in Seattle. Um, and in the design phase, you establish a steering committee, which is like the set of folks who are gonna write the rules, which include things like who can um, submit ideas for the, uh, for the participatory budgeting process, um, what the voting age will be, right? Because it doesn't have to be 18. These are rules that we made for ourselves. Um, who will be like the types of participants? Like we think about in New York City, we have folks who are undocumented who are major participants in the participatory budgeting processes. Um, so you make all these decisions. The design process part is my favorite part. So I could talk my whole introduction just about how you design a participatory budgeting process. But what happens after that is you open up the doors and you start idea collection, which is where folks get to start naming the kinds of ideas that they want to see in their community, what they want to see invested in. Um, after that, we bring in budget delegates who are folks who work with city officials, who work with um, subject matter experts, who work with experts in the community to turn those ideas into real proposals that can be voted on. Then the community comes in, votes, picks the ideas that will be funded. The ideas that don't get funded, though, do tend to like inspire things that move forward, right? Because those ideas from community don't just get thrown away because they don't win on the ballot. Um, and then after the winning projects are identified, they're implemented. And then there's the part that is super important, which is evaluation and starting it all over again. You look at the process, look at what went well, what went um, not so well, right? Because these are new ways of interacting with each other and you improve that participatory budgeting process. Um, so at PBP, we work with folks to win these funds. We work with folks to learn about how they can do it better. Um, and we work with folks to implement and improve and work through evaluation. Um, and I think that um, the part of participatory budgeting that is most exciting to me is the fact that through this process, there are the projects that win, there is like the outcomes, but there is also a fundamental change in how people approach the decisions around them, whether that be budgeting decisions, whether that be policy decisions, folks have a renewed sense of at like uh, control and have a renewed sense of understanding that these decisions aren't just happening in a vacuum, right? People are making those decisions and those people should be the ones who are most impacted. Hey, thanks for help. Um, Mitch, could you talk, introduce yourself and talk briefly about equity and transformation? Yes, hello everyone. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Richard Wallace, I'm the founding uh, Executive Director of Equity and Transformation, also known as E. We're based in Chicago. I'm also a member of the policy table and strategy table, table at the Movement for Black Lives. At E, we serve Black informal workers. Um, black informal workers are folks that are boxed out of the formal economy due to things like ableism, transphobia, homophobia, sexism, the mark of a criminal record. Um, and these workers are forced into the informal economy to essentially to make ends meet. Um, uh, our mission ultimately is to build social and economic equity. Uh, we achieve that by four main, basically four main pillars of work. We build um, alternatives um, that meet the immediate needs of our communities. Um, we empower through black wellness supports. Um, and there's a range of activities we do within that. Um, 
we grow, right? We we believe that we got to have power, and in order to have power, um, without a bunch of money, is to have people um, who believe in the same mission um, and who can advocate for those solutions. So we grow through chapters, um, and then we inform, um, and that inform pillar is extremely important. That's our research, um, our communications, and our advocacy. Um, so that's our work. Um, excited to be on the call or be on the panel, and look forward to kind of diving in deeper in a bit. Thanks, Rich. Uh, Temi, uh, could you introduce yourself and talk briefly about if a foundation for radical possibility? Yes, greetings, everybody. Happy to be here. My name is Timmy F. Bennett. I'm co-CEO of IF, a foundation for radical possibility. So about me, I'm an attorney by trade, living in Ward 5 in the Bloomingdale neighborhood of Northwest DC. I was raised in a Black nationalist Pan-African community on the south side of Chicago, so big up to Chicago. And I identify as a cisgender woman using she, her pronouns and a Black feminist. I'm also a descendant of American enslavement. My folks were enslaved in North Carolina, Arkansas, and Virginia. I'm also a member of the Movement for Black Lives Policy Table and the Reparations Working Group. So for me, my people are Black people in America, Black people in the diaspora, and people of the global majority. So if you haven't caught on yet, I have a deep love and reverence for Black people. I do this work for my ancestors, for my current family and friends, and then for my future descendants. Uh, I said defendants. Look, already, we do be defending ourselves. Uh, about if. We are a private regional racial justice foundation based in DC. We fund in Southern Maryland, DC and Northern Virginia. Our vision is that black people and people of the global majority live powerfully, abundantly and beautifully in healthy self-determined communities free of social, economic and ideological violence. We achieve our mission, our vision through Centering the leadership and expertise of Black people and people of the global majority in the Washington, D.C. region who live at the sharpest intersections of systems of oppression, in particular race, class, gender identity. And so we have five pillars that we do our work through. So that's community power, which is our participatory grant making, um, culture, which is our narrative change work. So we have a documentary coming out this year called Diminished Returns, all about the Black wealth gap in D.C., healing justice, systems change work, that's our government portfolio, and then the systems change work we try to do in the philanthropic sector, and then reparations and economic justice. And I'll pause there, Steve. Okay, thanks, Timmy. Uh, and Amara, I'll let you, uh, you'll get to be the last to introduce yourself and you know talk uh, about your work with Movement for Black Lives and about the series, because you played you weren't just the author of some of the pieces, but you know, really played a curatorial role in that series. So talk about what you were hoping to achieve. Sure, thank you so much, Steve, and to the MPQ team for the collaboration and also to the panelists who are brilliant uh, in their own right and also work for organizations that have really been at the front lines of uh, what we are advancing, which is a vision uh, for Black people that affects our material conditions that moves us toward liberation. And that's really the fundamental basis of all of the work that we do. What is liberatory? What moves us toward being self-determining, self-sufficient, and free uh, to thrive? And so with the Movement for Black Lives, that is a central part of the work that we do. So again, my name is Amara Enya, and I'm the policy director uh, for the Movement for Black Lives. And we are an ecosystem of a few hundred Black-led organizations across the country doing work to win the rights, resources, and recognition for Black people. Um, this work is held by uh, Black folks that are in their communities on the ground. Um, we have many base-building organizations that not only are uh, executing the work, but it informs our policy platform. So the policy table uh, all of that work, what we put forth in the vision, is informed by people on the ground. It is a uh, bottom-up orientation that is absolutely critical to make sure that whatever we're putting forth as our vision or policies are actually uh, relevant and resonate with the people who are most affected. And so that was uh, some of the thinking behind wanting to put together an economic policy vision for Black people. So we know that in 2020, which was four years ago, but it seems like it was just yesterday, it's a lot that's gone on. But around that time, there were it was essentially and still is a poly crisis. So um, we had the pandemic, 
Uh, at that point, the economic fallout from the pandemic, we had uprisings, not just across the United States, but around the world after the murder of George Floyd. There was there was a lot happening. We also had a change in uh, in the electoral side of things with the presidential election um, at that time. And so what became clear for us is that we definitely have to focus on what is an economic vision, what is a policy platform that we can advance for Black people that actually speaks to the very real issues that were that did not emerge in 2020, but that were exposed even further um, at, in, in the context of this poly crisis. So just some of the, the data points that people well know. So Black wealth, uh, for, for every dollar of wealth that white people have, Black folks have 24 cents to the dollar. Uh, we know that when it comes to housing affordability, now it's about 42%. People are spending about 42% of their household income just on housing alone. We are seeing um, the rates of evictions, uh, the unhoused numbers skyrocketing, and it's, of, of course, affecting Black people. We even at M4BL had looked into some of the systems that seem to escape scrutiny, if you will. There's a myth of objectivity about so many of the systems and institutions that govern our day-to-day -day lives. And so we looked at the tax system, and we found, uh, and this was also a study that was put forth at uh, Stanford University and some other researchers, that found that Black people are actually audited more uh, by the IRS. Not only are they audited more, they are penalized more uh, by the IRS. And this is the same IRS that, one, refuses to collect demo racial demographic data, but also that has a system that ensures that those who have wealth actually benefit from the tax code, which means white people. So those who have not been discriminated against through redlining, through being excluded from uh, home access to FHA loans, et cetera, those who've built up their wealth over years are actually the beneficiaries of this tax system. And uh, Black folks are actually uh, harmed by the tax system. Yet there's this notion of objectivity, like we pay taxes and it's just an objective way of, of um, that it's an objective process. So we wanted to really um, look at those institutional um, mechanisms that have actually been harmful and to propose what are the interventions that can actually uh, move us toward again, toward our liberation, move us toward at least repairing harm, right? Uh, and making sure that we are not continue we are not continuously being exploited and harmed by the economic system. And our economic power is tied very closely to our political power. And we know the dynamics of of uh, the link between economics and politics. And so it was really important that we focus on an economic vision as well. The other thing I wanted to draw attention to is the Black radical roots of our economic policy vision and economic justice writ, writ large. So in the opening piece for uh, the series, I mentioned that the Black Panther Party in 1966 released their 10-point plan. Uh, number two of that plan was a call for full employment. Um, this is There's a, a mirror, if you will, with a lot of the work that is taking place across the country. And I think uh, Rich has been involved in that work around guaranteed basic income pilots, right? Um, but again, that was number two of the Black Panther's 10-point plan was a call for full employment. Number three of the Black Panther Party's 10-point plan uh, was demanded 40 acres and two mules. So that was number three. And to accept that payment, the payment of that debt of 40 acres and two mules in currency, as an alternative, right? So this is in 1966. We also have civil rights activists like Fannie Lou Hamer, who started the the who's, Fannie Lou Hamer, who started the Freedom Farm Cooperative. So we've touched on a little bit around solidarity economy, and it's important to contextualize that with work that's happened long before the present time. And uh, Fannie Lou Hamer's Freedom Farm Cooperative secured 200, 200 units of low-income housing. Um, they also owned uh, the the cooperative served more than 1,600 families in the Mississippi Delta. The housing program created housing for 70 families, right? So this is some of the historical context to an economic vision, a black the black radical tradition of an economic uh, vision for black people. And I wanted to just kind of wrap up with a quote from Malcolm X, who in 1964 
of course, he gave a speech called the Black Revolution. And there's a, a, an, a notion of community control that is absolutely imperative. And it's why you'll hear in the series, we talk about participatory budgeting and this notion of community control of the institutions uh, that, that are in our communities are the institutions that govern our lives. So in 1964, uh, Malcolm X said, and this is a quote, our economic philosophy is that we should gain economic control over the economy of our own community the businesses and the other things which create employment so that we can provide jobs for our own people instead of having to picket and boycott and beg someone else for a job. And that's just a snippet of that speech. There are other quotes that I can uh, list off if we had time uh, from Fannie Lou Hamer and others talking about an economic vision. And so we are following that pathway as we set forth a vision uh, through this series and through our work. Great. Thanks, Samara, for really setting the stage. And, you know, I want to ask uh, other folks on the panel to weigh in on the Black radical roots of today's economic justice vision. So um, uh, whoever wants to go first, we'll, we'll pass it around. I really appreciate Amara's um opening to center us because I, I too agree. Um, at 1DC, we would also um, add on and emphasize the things that Amara talked about. So for us, it's about three buckets in terms of who we um, look to. So the Black re um, revolutionary struggle, both um, domestically and internationally. I'm thinking particularly of um, Navelle um, Alexander, and who was associated with the ANC before um, in the fighting against the apartheid in South Africa. And one of the things that he mentioned um, was that the revolutionary struggle, the Black revolutionary struggle, required rolling back of the market in very concrete ways. So making sure the market doesn't dominate and um, is not used to meet our basic needs in terms of shelter, um, clothing, et cetera. And then of course, like Amara just said, transforming the state um, and then practicing those cooperatives as she mentioned with Fannie Lou Hamer. But then in relation to that, I think at 1DC, we also stress that there's this need for us to focus on um, lifting up black working class property rights struggles, our struggles against um, the constant commodification and speculation around housing. And so, thinking about the traditions of um, Chicago and how the organizing against the predatory lending, um, the organizing that was happening against the disinvestment that led to the Community Reinvestment Act. And also in DC, thinking about our context in terms of DC creating a tenants rights culture politically and fighting for rent control. Although we can talk about rent control and our accommodations with capitalism or racial capitalism specifically. And then the last thing that I think um, I wanted to just uh, emphasize that Amara shared, shared already was our movement solidarity with indigenous people. Um, I think at 1DC and many of the movement organizations that are on this call, we're very much committed to trying to think about how dispossession is an ongoing practice, one that we've learned from indigenous people here and around the world, that's very much committed to settler colonialism. And so constantly using property rights and using the courts and the states, as well as investor capital, which I'm sure we'll talk about soon, um, to constantly justify that ongoing dispossession and then speculating and then commodifying even more the land um, and debt uh, tied to that land. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um... I agree. I'm, Dr. Mars it's always hard, you know, because you, you laid out a canvas and I'm like, yo, I'm just going to add to it a little bit. I'll put the little dots on there. Um, but again, I think, you know, coming from the movement for Black Lives, also thinking about the uh, the organization, the home team, Equity and Transformation, also known as EAT. Um, what I what comes to mind for me when I think about the, the roots, um, I got to go back to conflict theory, right? Like I got to get, you know, anti-capitalism, um, in particular, conflict theory, which focuses on competition among groups within society over limited resources when we know there is an abundance. I say that specifically because I'm in Chicago right now and we're dealing with the quote unquote migrant crisis. And you're starting to see the politics and the origins of scarcity surface 
um, in, in a city where we're, we're the fifth largest, one of the largest economies in the world. Um, uh, Self-determination, essentially empowering communities to uh, control uh, their economic destinies, right? So community control over the means of distribution, however you talk about that. Um, that also comes from the, the Black Panther Party. So um, definitely reflecting on uh, Chairman Fred's vision um, in Chicago. Uh, in addition to that, I think there's a deep, there's deep roots as it relates to um, internationalism. Uh, the idea that we as Black people uh, will only be as free as Mother Africa at the end of the day, um, and that our freedom in the U.S. is intrinsically linked to the freedom of all Black bodies, right, um, across the globe. Um, in addition, there's abolition, right? And abolition is a twofold commitment, not to just dismantle, because I see a lot of half-hearted abolitionists out there that are, are hell-bent on the dismantle conversation, but are are um are novice at best as it relates to what it is we're trying to rebuild. Um and so it's a twofold commitment um along the lines of dismantling harmful systems, imagining new possibilities, piloting those possibilities, right? That means testing those possibilities because sometimes they don't work, even though they sound great on paper. Um they don't work, right? Um piloting those those um those those possibilities and and building the alternatives, right? Um and last but not least, I think which is the topic of the um uh, the piece that I was able to produce was reparations. Um, and there should be full repair for the harms of chattel slavery and imperialism. Um, and and so I think those are the historic roots. And I think there's a lot of, um, you know, I often think about a lot of the policy advocacy fights within the U.S. as being like, just imagine you had a whole apple and you and you cut it into a million pieces, right? All of those little pieces, that that full apple is reparations. Right. And and so we're fighting over here for this particular policy, which which aids and assists us in achieving this larger outcome of reparations. But when we get the whole apple, right, that is that we have received compensation. We have received rehabilitation. We have acquired restitution. There's been guarantees of non-repetition and the people are satisfied. And so for me, reparations is that full pie. Right. Um, and so. You know, I'm I'm sure we'll dig in deeper into um, in the particular questions that you'll ask, but that's where I feel like the historic uh, radical roots or where they stem from. Yeah, I'll jump in. I'm just gonna add because I agree with everything that's been said, and I I agree that we have to look at our you know historic models, and one that has been mentioned is like Shirley Sherrod. And like not the just the farm, I'm talking about the plan that they really had at first, which was a self-determined black town, right? That had education, that had employment, they had all the things. And so for us, we're really the goal with a goal to self-determination and honing in on like as far as the path to get there is really rooted in the principles of Ujima and Ujama, right? So I'm talking about collective work and responsibility and cooperative economics. It's collectively getting there together and with this goal of self-determination. I think that that goes to like all the things that have been said. And I'll pause there. I, yeah, I I feel like y'all just said so much that I want like a webinar on each thing that just came up. But I think across all everything that the thing that comes up for me is a major part of self determination is the idea that what we're trying to do is not join the system that is existing. Right? It's not about um, particularly when we're talking about like in participatory budgeting or like in participatory democracy work. Right? It's not that we want a black face in a high place, right? We're not looking to simply incorporate into a system that has proven time and time again that it not only was not built for us, but it was built actively against us, right? And so a major part of this self-determination, I appreciate, Rich, that you brought up the building part that comes after this, the dismantling, is iteration and experimentation and trying things together and building that trust in order to do that. Um, and a part of the radical tradition is that necessity of, of trust, right? And like of needing to be prepared to try something that hasn't been tried before, because we've seen what has been tried before fail. And we've not only seen it fail, but we have been the ones that it failed on, right? We are best positioned, I think that within the Black radical tradition, Black folks across the world are best positioned to set up what a vision for justice looks like because of the ways that the systems that exist have actively worked against us and that like intimate knowledge that we have we talk about content expertise right the folks who really know how much it costs to do this and that project but what we 
at PPP a lot talk about is context expertise, right? The people who live on that street know a lot better, right? Why that is so important, because what does that impact have? How does it roll into people's safety? How does people roll into people's ability to like thrive in their community? Um, so I, I think that like that piece of self-determination is really key, that we're not simply trying to join the system that exists. The uh, amazing answers, everyone. Uh, Tammy, I wanted to ask you, uh, yeah, to expand on the topic that you were interviewed by uh, Amara on on uh, the philanthropic case for reparations. And I, I'm aware that you guys came out with a, or contributed to a report recently as well. But you know, lay lay out the case for you know how philanthropy should be thinking about reparations. Yeah, I think the case for reparations for f the philanthropic sector is the case for reparations for everybody, right? Black folks are owed a debt. And on top of that debt, the wealth that this country holds does not belong to the people that hold it. Hold it. And so um, for as an organization, we came out for the first time as an organization in support of reparations to Black people in 2020 in our, 20, in our 10 year strategic plan. And the question that we got to, because we are a health world, we were our HMO conversion. So our money came from the sale of the assets of an HMO. So a lot, and we were consumer health foundation. So a health equity organization focused around racial equity and the social determinants of health. But in 2020, we were having our uh, board and staff retreat doing strategic planning and we were doing the verses. Y'all remember verses during COVID where it was an artist against another artist. And so the, the verses for us was racial equity versus racial justice. And the question that was asked was, what do Black people need to heal? And so, and the answer was an, like an acknowledgement, right? An acknowledgement of the intentional harm done to an, a collective people. And then with that acknowledgement came an, an obligation to repair, right? So it wasn't out of charity or out of our philanthropic good-heartedness that we are censoring Black people in this work and that we are saying that they are owed a debt. It was out of an obligation and a duty to repair because of past harms. And so for that, for us, that felt like justice, not equity. And so we shifted to this racial justice lens and we shifted to be a private foundation censoring Black people. And with that came our stance on reparations. And yes, we believe that government owes reparations. We believe that at the local level and at, and at the federal level, but also we believe that the sector owes repair and redress as well. And so how could, and so we are advocating for re reparations at the government level. So we are actively, um, you know, we had the hearing in DC for our task force last June. We funded and organized around that. We also are funding a coalition right now um, that's facilitated by a friend of ours, Ronnie Gass who is uh, pushing the advocacy right at the local level but then um and then we're doing some work in Maryland as well but then like we also felt like the sector owes a debt and like so the same way that somebody could say that the government owes a debt somebody can say that to all philanthropic organizations and so we wanted to learn more about our wealth origin and so we commissioned NCRP and CRP is a national committee for responsible responsive philanthropy back in 2021 to develop a report and to research our wealth origin um, and to, to come up with a qualitative number and, and like let us know like how we got our origin and like um how much of that wealth was extracted from black genius and black labor, right? With this, with this uh goal of redress. And I'll tell you, it's been a journey. So the report came out in January, January, end of January. We're very excited about it. Um, it is called Cracks in the Foundation, Philanthropy's Role in Reparations to Black People. And it is looking at our endowment and the endowments of seven other foundations in the region. So eight total. And uh, we're the only volunteer participants. So I'll, I won't sugarcoat it. The other seven foundations are not happy about this report and we're very upset. And so it, it, it illuminates ways like you, there is power in naming the thing. We can say all day that Black people are owed or dead. But once you start like coming out with the receipts, it, it feels very different and people feel pe people do feel targeted right and and as they should because we're we're speaking directly to them and we're speaking directly to the sector this methodology we believe can be replicated this is a pilot we hope that other foundations will, will do the same thing and it's not just about this is just about the wealth origin right but it's not just about wealth origin it's about where your endowment is now what invest where are you invested in right now right like if you're giving out five percent of your wealth 
towards, and most of them are not going to Black-led organizations, right? Most of them are not going to the BIPOC organizations, but if you're only giving out 5%, but the majority of your wealth is in private prisons and in guns and in extractive um, investments, then you're, you're a part of the problem. So it's not just wealth origin, it's where you're invested now, it's who holds your wealth, who are your wealth managers. And so all of that we believe should be on the table when we're talking about philanthropic redress to Black people. And I can pause there because there's a lot I could say about this report, but I, I think we're sending the link so people could download it. Please check it out. Yeah, I did put the link in the chat. So, and it's it, it is a powerful report, and really, especially if you go to the appendices, you'll see exactly what uh, Demi is talking about. The individual wealth history. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Richard, I wanted to throw it to you, and, and you write about the uh, effects of the war on drugs and mass incarceration and a uh, call for uh, reparations and public policy around that. Um, you know, sort of lay out the case of, of what you were talking about. Yeah, so again, E, um, representing equity and transformation here in Chicago, uh, really unique story on how we landed on drug war reparations, but we fought for, again, we organized black informal workers, those are folks that are boxed out of the formal economy. Um, and so in the informal economy, what we learn is that occupations are not fixed. They often migrate between informal and formal, right? So you have folks that were bootleggers, right? Some of the best bootleggers in the world were black folks, right? But the second it becomes formal, right? It's now legal, right? After prohibition, all of that, right? It becomes illegal, you see a lack of retention in Black ownership in the other side of the sector, right, once it becomes formalized. Same thing happens with ride sharing, same thing happened with, like, number running, right? And so when we started noticing this trend, we began to organize Black cannabis sellers in the legacy market to advocate for entry into the recreational market, right? At the time, there was a medical market in the city of Chicago, and there was 40 to 45 dispensaries all owned and operated by white people. There was not one Black owner in the medical industry in recreational, I mean, in the medical cannabis industry. Um, and so that can, that policy, we, that policy fight was our first policy fight. Shout out to Peer Cannabis Coalition. And we won the first recreational cannabis policy to incorporate reparations for the war on drugs. That was important that they stood on stage and said, this is about reparations, because now we holding their feet to the fire. Because what we saw after the first year is that although there were you know, um, you know, under cannabis legalization, there was a, about 2,000 some odd arrests and 80% of those arrested under legalization were black people. And so we began to assess, okay, well, where are we going? How, how is this reparations if our people are still continuously being harmed? Um, and in reality, what we had was very short. It fell, fell short, extremely short from reparations. And so we began to build this larger drug war reparations campaign that we call the Big Payback in the city of Chicago. And now we're fighting for, and I think, again, as abolitionists, we're not just saying, you know, what, what the problem is, we're actually active in developing the alternative, right? So we piloted a program around compensation called the Chicago Future Fund, which gave direct cash payments to formerly incarcerated people, survivors of the war on drugs for 18 months. And it was a study. We looked at income volatility, psychological, all of those good things. Um, and then we began to, and we're in a stage now where we did, edu I mean, the other part that, that is very important is that the work can't live on these Zooms. The work has to live in the communities. If we talk about solidarity economy, if we talk about reparations, if we talk about any of those things, if the, the people aren't saying that, when they knock on doors, right? If they ain't demanding that in that moment, right, then we losing, right? Because we can't do it alone. We actually need people. We got to move people, right? So a big part of last year at Equity and Transformation was like building up that that base of, of community advocates that could speak to this and demand this, right? Because at the end of the day, that's how democracy works, unfortunately. Um, and so, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, like they need, a, they need an educated base of their constituents, quote unquote, to do the right thing. Um, and so um, we did that political education. But I do want to say, um, and so we are fighting for compensation right now, right? Um, but I am a firm believer in, you know, comprehensive reparations, right? Um, and I will say very clearly that both both mass incarceration, the war on drugs, and the war on drugs are products of anti-Black racism, right? Which is, which is a well-thought-out strategy, right? 
um, beyond the harms that each one of them caused, they served as modes to operationalize existing racial um, racist ideals held by white supremacists, right? So, this, so in other words, mass incarceration, the war on drugs are just modes to operationalize this like white supremacy, right? It's a way to other black people, right? The 13th Amendment essentially makes us slaves again. When we come home after doing time and I'm formerly incarcerated, right? We got 1,300 collateral consequences in the state of Illinois, over 1,100, my bad, collateral consequences of permanent punishments in the state of Illinois, limiting access to housing, education, so on and so forth, right? So this system of white supremacy has to be, has to end, right? And I think that reparations is a pathway to, to that, right? Because it provides that guarantee of non-repetition. It also has a pillar of restitution, right? Which, which, which means ultimately that we're going to restore survivors of a particular harm to the condition they were in before the harm occurred. And so for me, that's reconnecting myself and my story and my family's story and our lineage, right? Um, back to land, language, and lineage, right? So that's going back to the continent of Africa. I think for a lot of us, my story begins and ends, begins in Arkansas and Jackson, Mississippi. So a big part of my story before the transatlantic slave trade, right, is I, I've been, it's been stolen from me. So restitution means that I'm going to be restored, right? My, I mean, and also I feel like that gives a bit of homage to those ancestors that survived the transatlantic slave trade. Because if we end the story with the moment they stepped on, on, on this soil, right, then we're doing a disservice to the ancestors that came before us. So for me, I feel like full comprehensive reparations is, is a necessary antidote, right, to uh to to achieving i think what we what we talked about earlier anti-capitalism self-determination abolition those frameworks right and so again that's 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 where i'm coming from from the city of chicago that's a campaign that we're leading at equity and transformation it's called the big payback um we are fighting for drug war reparations but we see the drug war as one of the modes we saw the three-fifths clause as one of the modes we saw jim crow as one of the modes black codes as one of the modes redlining as one of the modes this is the mode that we fell into due to our advocacy around Black and former workers. Um, and so the same remedy applies for each, right? Restitution, rehabilitation, compensation, guarantees of non-repetition and satisfaction. I'll close with that. Thanks, Rich. Um, that's amazing. Um, Rahel, I'm going to move it, the conversation to you and, and talk about uh, participatory budgeting and you know how does it lead to how does it lead to more effective community-based decision making regarding the allocation of public resources? Yeah, for sure. Um first of all, like thank you, Tammy and Rich. Like I I I'm like changing my even my thoughts as y'all speak, so I appreciate that. Um I, I always say that participatory budgeting is a tool, right? It's a method, it's an approach. Um and the thing that really has come up quite a bit in hearing y'all rich and telling is like this idea of repair and the part of repair that people are very hesitant around is the part that comes before and Tammy, you named it it's acknowledgement um so one example that i named in my article that i'll talk through a little bit more is um la repair which is a participatory budgeting project a process happening in the city of la which is focused on um a type of equity that makes people quite uncomfortable, right? Which is the type where you look at what happened, you acknowledge it, and you um, actually distribute funds and think about how you're going to move through the participatory process um, with that acknowledgement in mind, right? So this is not a citywide process. It's um, focused and based on um, key repair zones, which were identified through um, particular kind of indications, right, of um, impacts of white supremacy, impacts of systemat systematic anti-Black racism and disinvestment, right? So this included things like employment and poverty data, um, home access to internet, impacts of COVID-19 um, case rates, right? Because we saw how that was disproportionately impacting our communities. Um, and the, those repair zones are doing participatory pr uh, processes. Um, and they're currently actually in their vote right now to actively address the ways that these indicators of uh, well-being or these indicators of how a community is thriving or not 
um, are not incidental, right? They are based on historic disinvestment, historic targeting, and historic purposeful criminalization and um, and and the kind of uh, imp legacy of that. Um, and so there's no way that you're going to be able to correct anything without first acknowledging that. And they've been moving through that. Obviously, it has its limitations. Um, it is in its kind of pilot beginning phases. Um, but I think that one important thing that it shows is that when you use participatory budgeting, participatory processes as a method to directly and like really boldly face what legacies you're standing on, there's a lot of opportunity to have conversations that you're not having otherwise, right? You're not gonna have these conversations during an election cycle about how a particular neighborhood was particularly targeted. You're not gonna have conversations about how you use actual money to think about how Skid Row has been targeted specifically um, by economic disinvestment. And so I think that that's one of the major strengths of participatory budgeting is that it is a tool that folks can use to open up really important conversations and actually have them in a bold and, and impactful way that puts real impact, real money behind those conversations, right? Not a couple of candidates having a discussion about how this community is feeling the impacts of white supremacy, but actually putting that money into community's hands to decide what to do with it and start a process of real repair that involves an exchange of power. Um, another key part of how participatory budgeting project has been thinking about um, participatory process processes as a tool to, to move towards justice has been other forms of participatory democracy, right? Our current representative democracy is purposely built in order to enact anti-Black racism, right? It is, representative democracy cannot be the method by which we get free. We need to rethink democracy and we need to think about a version of democracy that is about more shared power, that is about shared decision-making, that is about community holding decision-making power, not simply shifting what single individual is holding that overall power, right? So we're working um, through Democracy Beyond Elections, which is a coalition where we're partnering with other folks to think about other forms of participatory democracy, thinking about um, community assemblies, right, where folks are able to move through decisions, participatory policymaking, where folks are able to, like, actually have a say in the policies that are impacting their lives. Um, and we see what happens when that is not the case, right? We see the impacts of the war on drugs. We see the impact of all these policies that were made behind closed doors by our representatives who don't represent us. They represent the interests of white supremacy. And so in order to actually have a system that represents us, we have to be the ones representing ourselves and we have to have direct democracy. Um, another key thing that I'll kind of name and, and pass along um, after is that the kind of education piece you talked about, Rich, is so important and is one of the tools that I think that representative democracy, I think like folks who want to be gatekeepers, folks who want to say that we can't do participatory processes, lean on, right? Is that, oh, well, you know, you elected us to make these decisions because we know more, right? Or we, you know, have whatever base of knowledge. And that is not, this simply not the case. It's about access, right? And so if we are willing to really put our full strength behind political education, behind making sure that our people have the access to that kind of education, there is no reason why those decisions cannot be in our hands around dollars and cents, that kind of investment behind policy, behind the real things that we are the actual experts on, but what is lacking is a willingness to invest in political education, a willingness to invest in actual power sharing and power that is not representative, right? Power that is not about, oh, I pick you to take my power, but is actually about growing and learning together and being willing to move through that. Um, so yeah, I'll pause there. Thanks, Rahel. Um, Rosemary, I, I wanted to pass the baton to you. And, and you know, we talked about uh, the Black Radical Economic Vision before, you know, ap apply that to the housing justice work you're involved in. Again, um, appreciative of my panelists who went prior to me, um, also inspired me to add some and modify some things. So of course, the, the value of having um, the goal of decommodified housing that's rooted in 
gender, racial, and indigenous justice. Um, that would require that we start to unpack some very ugly truths about our economy. So in this country, 20% of our gross domestic product um, is housing related. It's all about the housing economy. And so from mortgages to developing, building these homes, we're all very much, in, even our retirement, our 401ks, we're all very much implicated in holding up the speculative um, investment in land and housing. And so one of the first steps would be that we again acknowledge the extent to which we are all invested in this project of holding up property rights uh, through you know, um, private ownership. That would then require us to then pressure our national and local officials on redirecting our financial resources to actually invest in these in the things that we value, which are cooperatives, investing in a responsive state that actually re, that plays a redistributive role as opposed to a um, the role that it plays now, which essentially subsidizes capital accumulation. And so that would mean for at one DC, one of the things that we deeply invest in is making sure that we expand and preserve deeply affordable housing. We can talk more about the financing and how that actually hinders the financing. And then also what Amara talks about in her article is the professional class um, that I think um, is constantly modifying um, and mediating who actually gets access to these um, resources. But we would need to invest in shifting the financial structure over time, and this will be generations um, to get us away from this speculative investment in debt and housing. Then we would also have to think about how we're going to build up our alternative institutions. One of the biggest historical weaknesses is that we've had great historical examples of co-ops, but one of the hardest things about sustaining co-ops is having the infrastructure, both the educational apparatus, but then also the, um, the financial apparatus to sustain um, these cooperatives when leadership transitions or um, when external forces, because this country is so deeply invested in private ownership that's oriented towards profit accumulation, you'll have constant external attacks on these cooperatives. And so spending more time in investing in these educational infrastructure um, and cooperative servicing um, groups that actually help to train and then the last big thing about that infrastructure and establishing um, a working class infrastructure oriented towards cooperatives is also unpacking um, and developing more popular means of educating the entire American society on how we need to actually disinvest from ideas of home ownership being the ideal form of actually getting included in American um, quote unquote democratic capitalism. So that would mean going and challenging those ideas about home ownership, which are very much related on this idea that there's a hierarchy of steward or um, stewardship or ownership, um, which means that that would mean going at our wealth generation strategies. So for the last 50 or so years in this post-civil rights era, we've had more access to these markets um, in terms of the home ownership markets than we have many, many more Black entrepreneurs who are using access to debt and ownership of homes as a way for them to generate their wealth origin and their um, wealth generation strategy on the backs of many of us, many other working class folks. And so we would need to challenge this um, investor um, strategy, even amongst our own. And then the last thing is developing um, like you all just said, a commitment to acknowledging the extent to which we're all invested in it um, and being honest about how we can support each other because this isn't about shaming. We all have it. I'm, I have a retirement account as well, 401k as well. Um, and so we would then need to then think through ways we can talk to each other about ways that we ourselves are actually investing in alternatives, whether that be co um, cooperatives, credit unions, things of that sort, alternative institutions that actually are invested in um, cooperative stewardship over land and housing. I think I'll keep it there. Great. Thanks, Rosemary. Uh, 
Amara, I'm going to go to you and then we'll, we'll I'm actually going to combine the question with a question from the audience. So the question I was going to ask you is what narrative changes are uh, needed to advance the policy vision. And then I'm going to add to this a question that uh, Trevor Smith put in the chat. Um, you know, what role does shifting culture and anti-Black narratives play in in this work? And how do we go about shifting uh, neoliberal culture and uplifting pro-Black narratives? So I think those are related. So I'm throwing them both at you and then others can also reply after. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, I just wanted to lift up all of the, the comments in the chat and the insights. I, I haven't been able to follow everything, but I've tried to follow some and it's just it's it's so rich and so I just wanted to express my gratitude to all of the attendees for for sharing those insights as well as to the panelists um, on this question of narrative and and the role that it plays in, in shifting um, really in shifting realities I mean I think narrative shift is critical um, but it's 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 a couple of things. So anyone who's been in the reparation space, and I know there are some veterans in in this event, knows that four years ago, five years ago, these conversations were not happening. Uh, a mere few years ago, it was like the R word. There were a, a group of you know faithful activists who've been for decades, decades, been at this work, and something happened the unpredictability of life, if you will. Uh, a space was created where the work that those faithful had done and have done, there was a turning point. And all of a sudden there was a possibility that was opened up for reparations to be talked about openly, uh, boldly at the local, state, national and international level in ways that are unprecedented. What that means is that there was a shift, not just in the narrative, but because of that work to shift, to shift hearts and minds, to get our people first and foremost to believe that the status quo is not all there is. And really that's the first thing. If we don't believe that an alternative reality is possible, then we won't even get to the point of the kind of narrative that can shift other people's thinking. And so on that, really being clear about the fact that vision and policy are not the same thing. And I think it's important to articulate that. So when we talk about vision and what we envision for ourselves, we've, we've heard self-determination, right? As a, as a fundamental right of black people. Uh, self-determination is not a policy. Self-determination is what we're shooting for, right? That's our vision. What does it mean to be self-determining? The policies are just the ways that we operationalize to move toward that vision that we have. And so the policies can shift over time. The policies can be anything that we can imagine them to be because they move us toward a vision that we have for ourselves. And I think in these spaces, because what I've noticed in the policy world is that it can be exclusionary, where um, policy professionals use language to intentionally obscure, to create distance between the people in their communities, our people, and those who are actually making decisions that govern our day-to-day -day lives. Policy tends to do that. And so what Rich mentioned about base building and about if we don't, we're not actually talking to our people, talking to our people, talking with our people, then we're really not doing the fundamental work because we're not going to win any hearts and minds and change belief if we can't even talk to the people who actually are closest to the issues. That's the work that we have to do. That's what actually feeds into narrative shift, which then can move us toward the kind of cultural shift that is necessary to actualize the vision that we have. So just, it's, it's, it is about recognizing what our vision is, the kinds of policies that move us toward our vision. And the last thing that I'll add is we have to get comfortable rejecting the premise. Now I'm the type of person, I reject the premise on anything and everything. You have just operate that way. I've always kind of been oriented that way. So if you tell me, oh, this is the global order, I'm gonna say, well, why? Oh, this is the way uh, the economic system, well, why? Says who? right? Whose imagination are we living in right now? 
That's the key question, because we are actually living in the imagination of individuals who believe that destroying the earth exploiting people, enslaving people is somehow the kind of world that we should live in. That's an imagination that has become real and now it is our reality. So our question is, or our charge, our mandate, at least if I'll speak for myself, my mandate is to reject every premise of every institution that governs the present day. Why? Because we're living in the results of that. So we can't even accept, and we shouldn't accept, for example, that, oh, the, the tax system, it's just the way that it works. Why? Because we know that it's designed to benefit some at the expense of others. Our monetary system, our education system, philanthropy, we can't just accept that it's these are the uh, benevolence, and so we are getting the, the results of benevolence through philanthropy. No, they built philanthropic organizations both on the racial capitalist system that governs the world and continues to exploit people. And so this report that Temi mentioned, it shines a light on that. And it should cause us to question the premise of every institution and to tap into the imaginative power that we have, which is our birthright that we have, to create the kinds of policies and to put forth the policies that move us toward our vision. Why? Because we can. Other people did. There's no reason why we cannot do the same and more, but ours will be grounded in values of justice and, and what I lean into African humanism that recognizes our humanity uh, as all people, but especially, you know, as Black people. And so if we can do that, then the narrative shift, I think, will follow that. And it will be, it will, it will sort of create the pathway for us to now actualize the kinds of policies that create the institutions that are actually life affirming. Great, thanks. Um, so I, I think uh, going through audience questions, there's a couple of questions here. So I'm gonna kind of combine them around uh, policy and, you know, are there specific policy recommendations each of you would have and any policy wins that you would like to uh, lift up? Um, so we can we can go around and see what, you know, whoever wants to jump in first. I'm happy to kick us off. Um, I, you know, the premise that I'm gonna set up, right, is that any policy should be built with the input and the decision-making of the people, right, who it's gonna impact. And so when we talk about participatory budgeting, we talk about these processes, but actually the overall goal is a systematic change in the way that budgeting decisions are made, right? It's not about a single process, it's about changing the idea that, oh, in a city of 1 million people, these 30 people decide how the budget gets spent. And in like really just flipping that on its head and saying, actually, the people who are impacted by those budgeting decisions should make those decisions. And so I would point to New York City's um, CEC, the uh, Office of Civic Engagement, um, which has been set up through a through the people of New York speaking for themselves. and. In New York City, um, we've gone from like four uh, city council districts doing participatory budgeting to now the majority of the city council districts do participatory budgeting. Um, and the people of New York became familiar with it, put it on the ballot, having citywide participatory budgeting and setting up an office that would make this institutionalized, right? That this is a part of how budget decisions get made. And this office exists and is now continuing to experiment and continuing to radicalize how participatory budgeting happens in the city and is continuing to grow that. Um, it's a process, right? It's always going to be growing and changing, but I would claim that as a win because it's an, a fundamental and institutionalized change in how decisions get made. That is not about a one-off. It's not about an, ex a, 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 you know, here's a chance to do something. Here, here you go. You're empowered. No, it's about actually fundamentally changing the system, challenging ourselves to engage with that change in the system, and making sure that that can't be backed up away from. I would also just shout out some of the cities that are doing their own kind of ways of institutionalizing participatory um, budgeting um, to varying degrees. Um, so in Boston, folks are moving to make it so that every year, a certain percentage of the city budget has to go into um, participatory budgeting. The same kind of battles are happening in Portland, they're happening in Cleveland. And the thing that remains the same in all of these is that the folks who are 
to me at least making the most specific and the most um motivating argument for why this needs to be institutionalized are the folks who are involved in black organizing right are the people who are able to point to why this is the only way that the city can actually make budget decisions that are reflective of what the city needs is by making sure that that power is in the hands of the people so you know it's not a direct policy but i'm like yeah change how your budget budgeting process happens before you even get to the point of the decision making change how those decisions get made talking oh rich you want to go go ahead Tim. so i think so there are a few things i want to say so one is like when it comes to even repair and what black people need right um i think there are a few there are various people have so many different definitions on what reparations is for black people but they're very like there are key elements that have to happen, right? Like, and so three are three of them. One is resources. And we're talking like land and money, right? The other one is like policies and programs. And people have all kinds of areas where they want policies and programs. And it can be wealth building, education, housing, criminal legal system, environment, health, employment, so many democracy, so many different things. And the third one though, is the most dubious of them all. And that's the end to the anti-Blackness, right? And that is that non-repeat, right? And that is the most dubious because this country is built on anti-Blackness and it's inherent in our systems. Like even today, like FBI just came out with a report, the most, the biggest, the top, uh, the top survivors of hate crimes are African-Americans, like black people, but specifically African-Americans in this country. And where is, there is no anti, like stop the anti-black uh, hate. We don't see those campaigns anywhere, right? Because of the insidiousness, the insidious, the insidious, insidiousness of anti-blackness in this country and how inherent it is. And so I wouldn't say there's a policy that we should do and we should be pushing, but we should be learning history and you should be developing your analysis, particularly on race. And so as Rahel talked about, like the participatory budgeting is a tool. Racial equity impact assessments are tools. Racial equity action plans are tools. There are tools everywhere. We have a few on our website if you want to check them out. But the whole point of whatever it is that you're trying to decide, policy, decision, um, procedure, practice, is to run it through that tool and have an analysis. Because the whole point of these tools are to find out who's going to benefit and who's going to be burdened by that decision, policy, procedure, and practice. And oftentimes, it's going to be Black folks that are going to be burdened, right, with a benefit or an advantage to white folks. That's just the way the system is created. That is structural racism. And so we're asking you to do like develop that analysis so you can figure that shit out yourself. And we're and we're saying, and when you see who's gonna benefit and who's gonna be burdened, when you see that it's gonna be BIPOC folks and black folks, then you redo that decision. That's it. Develop your own analysis, particularly on race, because that's what operates, that's how it operates in this country and in this context. And other thing I will say, absolutely agree with destruction and construction. We got to be able to dream the alternative. And I want to lift up what Amara talked about. Like, is the the goal is not to get what white people have. That is not the goal. And so that goes to that visioning and that construction and that um, radical imagination of a world that could be. And it's probably going to be like this. The secret is going to be an Afrofuturism. So go pick up some books, particularly Octavia Butler. But yeah. Yeah, family. Yeah, this is a great discussion. We can go on all day. I feel like I'm at, sitting at the kitchen table with y'all and we talking and there's a bunch of people that are listening, but I didn't, you know, I'm not thinking about it right now. So um, I was thinking to myself, you know, the 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 goal of an organizer is to lift up the contradictions, right? So if you're in a state that doesn't currently have um, cannabis legalization on the docket, it's coming. There's make, they're making way too much tax revenue for it not to show up. Um, and so I think when you're thinking about strategy, um, you know, cannabis legalization is a very explicit contradiction to the 94 crime bill, the war on drugs, so on and so forth. And so in those moments, we actually have to use the leverage of that contradiction in order to establish policy that 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 that, that creates, um, I, I would say, material changes for the communities that we serve. And so what we were able to secure in, in Illinois was 25% of the cannabis tax revenue, right? And so one of the one of the biggest challenges with most like GI pilots, guaranteed income, this, that, you know, the compensation components is that they don't really have a targeted uh, gener uh, resource generator, right? Um, and so in Illinois, just for instance, like that, that tax revenue, let me go to this, shout out to Rachel Pine on our team. Shout out to Ticey who's on the call too. 
Um, but that tax that tax revenue in Illinois was two hundred thirty eight million dollars um, in the first year of legalization, of which you know the the R three got forty nine million dollars, right? And so that's perpetuitous, right? That's going on for forever. So these resources are just going to continue to build, build, build. And so if we're saying, so I think being smart in strategy, assessing like where is where is the federal cannabis legalization at? Um, when is it going to take place in my state? Is there a medical? If you have a medical industry in your state, recreational is coming around the corner. They use them little white babies to to open up the door for, for medical for the medical industry, and then they they monopolize. And so we got to get ready and get prepared for that fight in those states. And then there was a question in here from Esteban um, that I want to just jump into real quick, and it was around enacting reparations framework. It's like, do we do rep? It's like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg kind of a thing? And for me, I feel like a lot of times we lead these conversations as it relates to, to the readiness of Black community um, from an ableist perspective, right? As if they don't learn the same way all people learn, right? And whether that be through your failings, et cetera, right? Now, and I'll, I'll use a, a, an, an example because I like to use, use real life. We had a lot of folks in Illinois, Black folks who were excited about recreational cannabis because you couldn't get a license unless you came from a social, from from generally black, brown communities across the state. Now, a lot of them thought they can go at it by themselves, that rugged individualism, that capitalism is like, teaches you. Um, and they couldn't, right? It's not my job to sit up with them and be like, you can't do it. You can't do it by yourself. You know, you, 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 you know that that's man, I'm, I'm nobody taught. I mean, I had to literally bump my head up against the wall a thousand times before I started to harvest the seeds, right? And so for me, it's like, we have to walk with our people through those contradictions, hold their hand, be with them, opposed to just saying like, ostracizing them for operating in the only way they've been socialized to operate for a very long time, right? And that's, that, that's, what, that's what it takes to be an organizer. An organizer is not about condemnation, right? It's about holding, right? Through contradictions, through failures, through whatever, through successes, Right. And then being like, oh, there's another way. Right. Or letting them find it. Dang, there's a better way. So now you got folks in Chicago that are like, man, Joe, I, I got I got 10,000. How many you got? I got I got 10,000. Whatever the case may be that are building what we would call cooperatives. Right. Or collectives in order to enter this market. Right. But that didn't come through us ostracizing them and telling and, and, and telling them that they can't do it alone. Right. It's like the people will get there just like each one of us. We didn't wake up Marxist, anti-capitalist, whatever, whatever, whatever. It was like, man, I, I learned through failure, right? And so for uh, for me as an organizer, it's not our job to assess, you know what I'm saying, the readiness of community as it relates to resources around compensation, right? And if we give it back to them, if somebody go out and buy some Jordans, that's not mine. It's not mine. Man, people were buy, probably buying I don't. whatever brings you joy. Get what you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not, you know what I mean? That's not my my job, right? But my job is to give, you know, and I think the importance is that self-determination of community and walking with people through the contradictions. I'm going to shut up. But it was great being here. And yeah, shout out to all of y'all. Um, was there anything you want to say about 1DC and some of the wins you guys have had? Um, yes, but shout out to everybody else, because I really do agree, um, particularly Rich, your point resonated a lot with me. Your last point about an organizer walking with folks as we all entangle our contradictions. So I think that's something 1DC does well, too, um, in the sense that we will literally say, OK, we want to keep we want to stay in our home. We know that we're existing in racial capitalism, all that stuff. We're tenants by we're forced to be tenants. And then tenants will say, okay, well, we want to get a good, a huge buyout. I don't know. If, I, I think I started talking off, um, starting this conversation about how we have this unique law. And so one of the ways that landlords step around it is they give buyouts. They try to give buyouts to the tenants to so the tenants don't contest their, um, their TOPA rights. And so, of course, that is an easy, low-hanging fruit. And so we're like, okay, we've worked with tenants. We've organized with tenants who said we're going to take this buyout. And then we've also worked with tenants who said, no, F that. I know that that $10,000 is not going to get me nowhere and they're going to tax me anyway. It's going to go right back to the state. And that became a way for us to actually have these more concrete conversations about what else can we do. And so speaking about one of the current wins, um, I'm going to share one 
W that's in formation. So the building that we're organizing in now um, was a product of the civil rights movement. Tenants um, organized with Martin Luther King, back black, black folks organized with Martin Luther King and some local civil rights leaders to make sure that this parcel of land, these two parcels of land were developed for black people to remain because urban removal oftentimes meant like James Baldwin said, Negro removal. And so they organized to fight to remain in that neighborhood. And so of course Shaw, um, if you guys know about anything about DC, Shaw's kind of like right in the middle, historically black neighborhood. Capital came in and said, hey, it's time to speculate. And we wanna make sure that Shaw becomes a, the new home for people who have tons of money to just drop into housing. So that meant most of the DC residents um, who were there, particularly black residents, were oftentimes displaced if you were tenants. And so these tenants in this particular building, they were dealing with the landlord pushing them out um, without telling them why. And they got so tired of that dispossession when they were pushed to one other side of the property and the landlord tried to sell the rest of the property under their noses. They then used that contradiction to say, no, you're going to make sure that you develop this property the way that we intended. And so right now we've been organizing with them and they've decided to make sure that that development is permanently affordable. That means in perpetuity, y'all. Um, they were only going to, they're in the process now of selecting someone who they believe aligns with their values. So they press these developers to make sure that they actually built permanently affordable family size units, because y'all know in a lot of these urban spaces with gentrification, they do not care about family size units no more. So those three, four bedrooms are to F and fine. So they are like, no, we're going to build three to four bedrooms. We're going to make sure tenants are included in the process. We're going to make sure tenants actually have veto power in different aspects of the decision making. So that type of power sharing is a huge victory in a city where we're constantly saying, how can we have strong tenant rights, but then have the highest rates of um, gentrification happening in the country? This building is one example of how tenants use their lived experiences and said, no, we're going to use these contradictions and we're going to actually motivate that, motivate us to think more broadly. And then I just want to lift up one last thing. There's also victories that we don't, that are historical, that we may have lost, but actually are very useful. So one thing about DC is that we actually had um, a victory of an anti-speculation tax. This is back when we had a majority black city council um, with many on the board that, um, many on the council that had ties to the civil rights movement. That was a huge victory. Now the landlords and capital capitalists came in and just shut that down. But that type of victory is really huge because then that sets a precedent for other cities to then say, we should be putting taxes on speculative, on activities that we don't want to see happen in the, in the economy. It happened in Vermont. They actually, DC adopted it from Vermont. And so there are other places where we are constantly putting regulations on what happens in the real estate. And I think those are some of the victories that we can lift up again and, and probably apply in our own context. Thanks. Um, Amara, uh, since there's a whole policy platform, I figured I'd let you jump into this question before we move forward. Yeah, so I mean, there are so many, I think, what we lifted up is it builds on things that are already in place across the country. And so when we talk about some of the things we mentioned, um, and the timing of, uh, of the last thing in the chat is just on point because I was going to lift up the work around cooperatives. They, we're not speaking in theoretical terms, right? So we can go to Boston, we can go down to uh, Jackson, Mississippi, we can go to California and actually see the things that we are talking about in practice. And those are, those are wins that we actually should be amplifying because it creates the conditions to be replicated. And essentially that's what we're trying to do, at least giving a line of sight to what the work could look like and what a win could look like, and then creating the conditions to replicate and to scale. And so we we that's really what we're leaning into. Um, I encourage folks, we do have a, a whole uh, vision for Black Lives Platform, and it has things like public banking. It has all of the solidarity economy components. It has, you know, what does an appropriate uh, tax, what are the things that we should be demanding around taxation? Should Black people be paying tax? Like, there are questions that we ask 
that inform the policy platform. And so I just want to encourage folks to, to check out the, the Vision for Black Lives policy platform, but also to tap into some of these local examples of work that are happening and to ask questions. This is where communities of practice become valuable because then we can learn from each other what worked, what didn't, what landmines do we need to avoid? That's the kind of collective and collaborative work that we need to be leaning into. Thanks. Um, so I'll just ask, so this is, a, this seems to be a popular question. So I'm going to ask it after a fashion and see, but the, the question is about how are your organizations uh, factoring in uh, climate change, you know, which could have potentially major impacts in terms of micro migratory patterns. I mean, the, the, the questioner suggests that people will come from American South into the Northern areas. Certainly that's not what's happening right now, but it could happen. Uh, but how do you think about uh, climate as it affects uh, pr prosperity, economic and land equity for black people? Anyone can jump into that. I'll say it's not contemporary for us. It's more historical because we're, a, again, a regional funder. So we're just in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And it's more like the historical um, um, and environments that Black people were placed in, right? So I'm talking about Buzzer, Buzzer Point in DC. I'm talking about where Black people, Black communities are and like the bus depots in the city. Like we're talking about, we're, we're thinking about that when it comes to repair. And it's more historical um, uh, climate uh, racism versus like contemporary. Any other thoughts on this? I mean, I'll, I'll just offer that the climate crisis is, you don't have, the climate crisis is tied to the system of capitalism, system of racial capitalism. So a lot of the interventions that we see around the climate crisis for those who are paying attention replicate. So when you talk about carbon markets and you know these are the neoliberal strategies that are proffered really to just make palatable the status quo. And so when we talk about economic justice, that's directly a climate issue because without the system of capitalism and exploitation, both of the land and people, we don't have uh, a climate crisis. And so we have to be thinking about that in our work. It is not some issue over there for people who love trees and the ocean. It is tied specifically to the ways that people are exploited, land is exploited and destroyed uh, for the sake of profit, for, for the sake of profiteering that gives no regard to the long-term impacts on, on land and people. And that's essentially what the climate crisis is. So everything that we do when we talk about justice, it we're either pushing back to create uh, a world that is not in crisis or we're listening to those who have created this current framework and are proffering so-called solutions that actually just make pouts like shifting the chairs on the deck of the Titanic, right? So we have to be discerning and understand what neoliberal offerings are, are being proffered to address climate. And we have to see ourselves in our work as part of uh, climate uh, justice work. Okay, thanks. Um... I'm going to go to maybe a related question. This is not about climate, but it sort of touches on the thing you were just talking about, Amara, but, you know, how do we develop and implement strategies to close the wealth gap, provide economic opportunity, and so on, in ways that don't uh, perpetuate uh, capitalist values or neoliberalism in ways that have, you know, harmed our communities? Um, so any thoughts about that? I think this was kind of what Esteban Kelly was trying to get at in, in his question, too, you know, sort of if you don't create the structures to capture the wealth in community, it can easily go in and leak out. Um, so, you know, how do, how, do you, how do you think about that? Well, that's why I think, and that's my point around cooperative economics, like what we know is white supremacy adapts, right? There, are, there have been moments in the times of black prosperity in this country and the system has corrected itself to strip us of that wealth. And so I think you have to be vigilant and, and diligent, but then also how are you 
in the places that you're like, if you're investing or you're trying to make impact, how are you making sure that the folks that, um, you know, that you're not perpetuating and causing more harm around gentrification and like, how do people get to stay in place? How do people that have been in these communities through the bad times get to stay when there are pro times of prosperity? And how do you intentionally keep the wealth in Black community, particularly when it comes to reparations, when we're talking about um, resources going to a specific group? What we know is that like when like some Black folks actually benefited from the GI Bill and then white folks went and created night, in, night school industries to strip them of those benefits so that like, well, you, you can't go to college unless you get this GED. So come pay all your money and your resources to get this GED and then you don't have those resources to get that college education, right? So we know that, so for me, it's just like, this goes back to anti-Blackness and white supremacy adapting. And you have to know that like, there will be predators there to get, and white supremacy will be the predator there to extract all the wealth they can. Like this will be an economic benefit for them too. So how do you control for that? is the question I think that everybody should be asking. Great. Um, I'll try to get one more audience question in. We're running short on time, but the question right. is, are schools a good pillar for endorsing and supporting uh, this work? And, and maybe how would be, I'll add to that. Yeah, this, there's yeah. been a lot of discussion about education, so I figured this would fit in. Yeah, can I add to the, just just one minute on, on Timmy's point? Um, the, the so reparations has I said four pillars, right? So if we get comprehensive reparations, that component of restitution, restoring folks to the, we didn't come here with those individualized. We came here with collective thought, right? So this this I mean a lot of it is is the medicine is in reparations, right? Deepening our relationship to. What I think what the elder in, in New Zealand said, re-indigenization, right, is an is a commitment, is a core commitment to repar to satisfying reparations. And so that will determine and that will assist with, I think, the re-education of our folks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in order to keep resources in community. And also, um, how do we use resources gained? To 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 address the the um, to to deepen our relationship with the continent, right? I mean, so I, I feel like there's there's a lot of knowing that will come through that pillar of restitution. I think oftentimes when we think about reparations, there's so much focus given to compensation that the other pillars of re reparations just go to the they fall to the wayside. But that pillar of restitution is my favorite, obviously, and so I'm always gonna lift it up as like, okay, if we're talking about what do we do with the bag when we get it, this is the pillar that will help us uh, and assist us with that. Um, yeah, and we can get to the next question. Okay, uh, well, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, any quick responses about how to um, advance this work within schools? I mean, I'll, I'll share that. I think for the last, for this question, and then I also wanna address the climate change question a little bit, I think it still has to do with decision making power and the kind of what Amara brought up earlier about that imagination and that kind of that premise, right, that you have power and that your power matters and should be acknowledged. Right. And so we do press for budgeting in schools and actually like have young folks be able to be part of making the budget decisions that impact them within their school. And that actually creates a very different kind of adult. Right. Um, it, it creates a kind of adult that isn't looking for somebody to represent them. Um, it creates a person who has a imagination of what real leadership looks like and has a, a different kind of vision of what even the role of government is right as a facilitator, as like someone who actually just facilitates the decision making that um, the folks who are impacted make. And so I think that that's, you know, a key thing is like getting that in early doing some of that visioning and imagination early and having that space actually be a place where people have power. And then just slightly on the conversation around climate change. Whoops, um, I want to share yeah. this article from my colleague Ingrid Haftel, um, co-published with an organization in Hawaii about how participatory budgeting um, can be involved in how in our interventions around climate change. And so this article is about participatory budgeting and um, renewable energy. And so just like I to me, at least the core of like many of our interventions or conversations is about decision making who decides and making sure that we are 
rooting our intervention there before the decision and who is deciding. Great, thanks. Um, so I think we're going to make that the last word because we need to, we're at time. Uh, I want to, before we close though, uh, thank all of our panelists, uh, Amara Anya from the Movement for Black Lives, to me, uh, Bennett from uh, if a Foundation for Radical Possibility, Rosemary Andubuisu from uh, One DC, Rahel uh, Teka uh, from Participatory Budgeting Process, and Rich Wallace from Equity uh, and Transformation uh, in Chicago. Thanks to all of you for your contributions. Thanks to the amazing uh, questions and chat. Um, uh, we will try to get some of the links out as you know when we send out the recording, um, uh, which will happen by Monday. And um, yeah, hope to continue this conversation. So thanks again, everyone, for their contributions. And uh, just to note, there will be another uh, Remaking the Economy webinar on April 17th, uh, so four weeks from today. And it's, good. it's with uh, Trevor Smith of the Bliss Collective, who's on this call, and um, we'll look at narrative change. Um, and it, if you can complete the evaluation at the, after you uh, log off, uh, please do that. That really does help inform our future webinars and work. Um, so thanks again to all our panelists.